Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead on porch time today. Guys, we've dodged the hurricane. Um, it, uh, it's done some things to our weather. It caused us to have absolutely no rain and the temperatures, rather than cooling off, have actually gotten hotter. So we're actually looking at a whole week as of right now right around 100 degrees every week as the actual temperature and that's not the heat index that's just the temperature um, so we're thankful that we dodged it but at the same time we are regretful that we're having such hot weather now you'll see behind me the flag we are having a little bit of a breeze every so often um, I'm looking out at my peppers even though I water them they're just they're shriveled up to almost nothing. This intense heat is just more than what they can bear. Um, we're going to do a video a little bit later. Um, don't know exactly what day, but we're going to do a video about the effects a lot of our plants are having right now. A little bit about the difference in gardening this time of the year. But um, regardless of that, first time today, I want to think about a subject. Uh, and it's something that I get hit with pretty often and we don't think about this a lot and it is it is dare to be different now I want you to think about that dare to be different the society that we live in today tends to want everybody to be the same I mean as a matter of fact that's part of agenda 2030 agenda 2030 is all about everybody being the same no one being wealthier than anybody else, no one having any more than anyone else, no one having any more food, no one having, no one having any more money. You know, we're all the same, and uh, basically that definition is communism. Uh, and that's why we should dare to be different. I mean, let's, and I know this is hard for people today to understand, but people from my generation should really be able to understand this uh, we used to have what was called the American dream you know to own a home and a couple automobiles and some land and stuff like that and you know to have a good job and raise kids and that was the American dream but today that American dream is being put to rest we no longer hear about the American dream. We hear about everybody being the same. They want us to all be the same. They don't want us to be different. And I guess in the homesteading community that's one thing that I really am impressed with is that everybody is trying to be different. We try to have the same ideas and the same goals in mind as far as being prepared but yet we all go about it in a different way. Some of us choose larger pieces of property, smaller homes. Some of us choose bigger homes, bigger land. Some of us just choose, you know, to to do what my mom and dad and them do, which is basically sharecropping. I mean, we live on someone else's property and we help them out in return for a place to live. And there's nothing wrong with any one of those that's the thing about it. There's nothing wrong with any one of them. It's whatever suits your need the best. Now what does aggravate me is people who try to go on and get someone else to pay for their way of living. You know, uh, homesteading is not about that. Uh, living a homesteading lifestyle is about cutting your own path in this world. And Literally, when I was raised, it was about making your own way in this world. You know, you didn't depend on anybody else to do it for you. You did it yourself. And our parents dared us to be different because we needed to be different. They wanted us to be different. God wants you to be different. Because in Scripture, He said, Come out from among them and be ye separate. In other words, be different than them. Come out of them. Come out of that system that the world is in. Be different. God wants us to do that. 
So if God wants us to do that, how much more should we desire to do that? It doesn't matter how you live, how much money you have, what kind of lifestyle you live, to what quality of life you live. The fact of the matter is, is how do you look at your Creator and how do you take care of your family? Now, I don't care how you take care of your family. That doesn't bother me. As long as you do. I mean, the Bible says that a man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. And the bottom line is this. Guys, we need to learn to provide for ourselves. So much of the lifestyle that we live today is being brought on us by the government. And, or by system. This, uh, a lot of people say, and I'm going to get into this a little bit. I didn't want to, but I guess I'm going to end up doing it. A lot of people go, well, I, you know, this New World Order. Well, I got news for you. Let me just go ahead and say this. You've been under the New World Order. If you were born around 32, 1932 forward, you're under the New World Order. If you have a Social Security number, you're in the New World Order. If you draw Social Security, you're in the New World Order. If you have Medicare, Medicaid, you're in the New World Order. If you accept any type of governmental assistance, you're in the New World Order. It's just, it's the system. Is it wrong? There's sections of it and parts of it, no, that are not wrong. If, if the government held money out of your paycheck and paid it into a system called Social Security, then at the end of your life or whenever your time of retirement comes, you should be able to get that money because it was never, ever, ever intended to be something to be lived on. It was simply in the beginning a program set into, and it set into motion to be like an insurance program. And the system today has turned it into something that people depend on living on. And I dare people come to be different. I dare people to be different. I actually have a letter that was sent to me from the government whenever President Bush was in office, uh, George W., that says, I need to start investing my money into other aspects because by the time I reach retirement age, my money's probably not going to be there for me to use. I was sent that letter. Now, whether my wife that passed away, I, I don't know if she put it in the safe or not. Just as a, just as something to keep to say, oh my God, we really did get this. Or I haven't even been through everything in the safe. I don't even remember. But I know we got the letter because I can well remember her bringing it to me going, Danny, look at this. And it just, at the, at the time, it just floored me. I was like, wow, for the government to send out a letter like that, that must be pretty serious. Telling me to invest some money in other areas other than Social Security so that I would have something to fall back on, you know. And that's why I'm telling you guys, it's part of the system. And I'm trying the, my hardest to tell people to dare to be different. Don't depend on a grocery store for your food. Be different. Why don't you try... Um, my strap's falling down. I'm going to tighten it back up. Why don't we try something called growing our own food? You know, it is what our forefathers done. Grocery stores have not always been in existence. You know, I think I done a video video here a couple years ago on on the uh, on how grocery stores came in, or big box stores came into existence. How we started off as a general store, and and you know, when you first went to the store, you wasn't you wasn't even allowed to walk. Off. Oh my God, forbid walk around in a store and have the ability to select your food. No. You went up to the counter, you had a list of paper, and you handed it to the man behind the counter, and he went back and he got your groceries and brought them out to you, and you paid for them. If I remember correct, I think it was Piggly Wiggly. Um, you know, up around Memphis somewhere or somewhere up that, there was one of the first stores that came into existence that allowed you to actually shop and choose your food. That was a new concept to people. 
people didn't do that in the past. They didn't depend on a grocery store for all of their food. Now there were the general stores that they had had staples like sugar, flour, rice, beans, some of these kind of things like that that people just couldn't have. Where they lived at, they would go to the general store and they would pick it up in 25 or 50 pound bags, cornmeal, different things like that, but most of them usually ground their own cornmeal because there was somebody in the community that ground. But they would pick them up in sacks and you know what, I can rent no older than I am. I can remember getting flour in sacks and my parents actually using the sack to make clothes out of. I can remember getting things like oatmeal or um, uh, different flowers and different things like that and actually getting wash towels and washcloths with it when you got it. What happened to that world? Tell you what happened to it. We live in a microwave society today. And this microwave society has, it's a throwaway society. Our shoes. My grandfather was a cobbler. He made his money fixing people's shoes. Nobody fixes shoes anymore. You can order a pair of shoes that can be fixed, but you're going to pay probably the last ones I bought were like $200 a pair. That's been 25 years ago. I still have those shoes because they can be repaired. And that doesn't exist anymore. My grandfather would be out of business today. He, there's no way he could earn a living if he was here today. Because everything is throwaway. I mean literally everything. Your clothes, everything. People used to patch clothes, used to do all that kind of stuff. Now, when you wear something for a little while, you just trash it. You know, it's, it's everything's that way. Even automobiles is becoming that way. When they get a certain amount of mileage on them, you just junk them. Get another one. I'm just waiting for houses to, to come to a point where we live in them for so long and we go, oh, well, I'm through paying for them. I'll get another one, you know, and just get another one. Because we live in a microwave society and we've raised two generations of people to live that way. I'm amazed at the things I sit and talk about to some of the younger generation. They have no clue about what I'm even talking about. They're like, no. There's no way it could have been like that. And I'm like, if you only knew. You know, when I got married, which has been my first time when I was a young man getting married, and I got married at 18, yeah, around 18 years old. That's just a long time back for me to remember. I could buy land for $200 an acre. Anywhere between two and seven hundred dollars an acre. Anywhere, depending on where it was at, and out in the country. Today, I could kick myself in the seat of the pants for not buying more than I did. But what it is, it is. But the thing about it is, is everything has changed, and everything is that there's a movement going on that is to take as much away from us as we can, so that we have little today. And my thing is, dare to be different. Everything is about downsizing everybody because too few of people have too much. Grandma and Grandpa's huge farms, or when they go into the hands of the kids now, what's the first thing they do? Oh, money! I can get money for this, you know? They, have, they don't stop one minute and think about how hard Grandma and Grandpa worked for that, to have it. They want that instant gratification. And I'm telling you guys, be different. Be the one that's different. I talked to an elderly gentleman. He was in his 90s. Had a lot of land. And I asked him, his name was Frank. I'll, I'll say that. I said, Mr. Frank, that 20 over there that you own, how did you come about that? And he said, well, son, he said that become available about 1930, I think it was, somewhere in that area. He said it was before we all went through that thing, the depression thing. He said, 
He said, of course, we didn't know any different when the Depression happened. He said, we just lived on the farm. We never went to town hardly, maybe once a month. If we was lucky, we went once a month. He said, I never drove in my life, and he didn't, never drove a vehicle. He bought a brand new tractor. They, they delivered it to the house. He got on it and didn't understand how it worked and got it cranked up and it took off with him and ran through the side of his barn and went dead. And uh, that's where he left it at. And he said, that's dangerous. People can get hurt with that kind of stuff. And, but he said, anyway, the property, he said, I caught, uh, I caught and sold skunks, coons, picked up pecans, and sold gophers. And I raised enough money, son, to pay for that land. He said, it was a devil all those years afterwards trying to keep the taxes paid on it. But, you know, it sure has been nice having it, though, because it ain't, there ain't been nobody right over in there. He said, now on down the road there, people's building up pretty big. And he said, Papa left it, the other 160 that he had there. He said, Papa left us that. He said, my brother bought the other 100 on the other side over here. He said, and I bought another 100 off over there. He said, you know, I never held a public job in my life. I've always lived right here on this farm and sold vegetables off my farm here. He said, people come here to buy from me. I don't know why, Danny. Why? I don't know why they come to buy from me. They could raise it themselves. But they do. And I sit and listen to the story of the old man. And I thought about, wow, how different it is today. How different things are. He was amazed that people came to him and bought vegetables. He said they could raise them theirself. I don't know why they do it, but they'll come pay me. And he says, and I'm okay with that. He said, because I just live on the farm here. He said, we always have an abundance, so I've always sold it, you know, and always made it. So I raised some cows. He said, I got a guy who comes, picks up a few cows for me every so often, hauls them off, and uh, he pays me. And then when the old man passed, the family just busted up a lot of the land and sold it. Now he didn't have any kids, but he left everything he had to one of his other family members and they had some kids. And first thing they did was went in and stripped all the trees off of it, all the big timber. He thought that was the beautiful thing in the world. He was always talked about his big timber. and. I used to ride around through it with the wagons and stuff, and and it's but when he was telling the story, I could almost ride on the wagon with him to hear him tell it, and I could almost hoe in the garden with him, listening to him talk about hoeing his tomatoes and stuff like that, and how he planted them. Uh, it's amazing, and um, he'd always tell me. He said, "You know, plants don't grow today like they used to." He said, used to, we'd throw some tomato seeds out there in that little bed right out there. He said, we'd grow hundreds of tomatoes. Gosh, Danny, hundreds of them. He said, they'd just come up in wads. He says, you can go out there and take your hand, grab a whole wad, pull them up. And just take them out there in the garden and just take your hoe and chop a hole in the ground. And uh, He said, we always kept a bucket of mud. And he said, we took a big handful of mud and wrapped it around a root on one of them plants and throwed it down in the ground and covered it up. He said, them things would grow like weeds. Have big old tomatoes all over them. He said, but today, can't even hardly get one to live. Don't understand it, Danny. And to listen to the old man's story told me just how much and just how different we are today and how different things are. You know, I have a lot of old stuff here. I got a lot of old hand stuff. I can grind my own cornmeal. I can do a lot of things here. I got draw knives. I can make my own stuff. I got hand saws and all kinds of different things like that. This old hand bracing bits and and when I do decide to sit down and use one of them, I think about how hard it was for somebody back then to just do anything and how much time it took and how much effort was put into just doing something. Now. We want to be able to grab an electric drill or a cordless drill up and just punch a hole right through something. Now, man, let's get this done. I was hanging some gates in the pasture back here, and I, I didn't take the generator back there. I took that bracing bit and went back there, and I augered, you know, sitting there augering the holes in this post, and it took me like, it took me like an hour to put those two 
anchors in that post and uh and get the gate hung and I I sit there and thought about it. I said, you know, I could have brought my cordless. I'd have been through with this in 10 minutes. And I thought about how much things had changed. We just want everything to be fast today. We want it to be quick. You know, our, our grandparents and our forefathers didn't know what quick was. I remember Daddy telling me that they used to travel to a town where Wanda's actually from. They would travel when he was a kid. It was all gravel roads and it was an all day trip to get there. Uh, only 75 miles, but it was an all day trip. He said, you know, son, if we got up to 35 miles an hour in an old car, he said, uh, boy, we was moving on. You know, an old gravel roads, he says, and when you met somebody, you slowed down. And I'm thinking, 35 mile an hour has already slowed down, but to them, boy, that was that was something because they were used to riding in horses and you know buggies and uh, things like that. And he said, I remember one time he said we couldn't keep it in we couldn't keep it in high gear. He said, uh, Daddy stopped on the side of the road and cut a forked stick and stuck it in the back of the floorboard by the seat and punched the shift lever forward and put it behind it when we got going and. It held it in gear till we got to Columbia. I think it was a town was Columbia, where uh, Daddy could maybe get a part. I think he went got a part and he took the transmission out of it and fixed it the day we was there, so that we uh, could come back home. He said one of the uh, rails in it, the synchronizer, the rails and the balls and spring or something other in it. He talked about how it had got where it wouldn't stay in gear. And I think about wow how different things are. People then, you know, 75 miles, it took them all day to get there. That was a one day trip to get there. And he said, if you could get up to 35 miles an hour, you was really moving on. He said, but we didn't really, only a couple of places in the road we could get that fast. He said, we was usually around five, eight miles an hour most of the time, up and down hills. Old roads were gravel, they were muddy. And he said, you know, you didn't want to get stuck. You know, and he said, things are just different, son, than what they used to be. And I remember my uncle living off down here in, in the swamp on one of the creeks down below us here, about 20 miles from here. My dad took me squirrel hunting when I was a kid. and The, the trees were so tall in that swamp. I had a little 410 shotgun, and my shotgun wouldn't even shoot a squirrel out of the top of them. They were so tall. I remember shooting at them, and I thought I was missing. And Daddy goes, "You're not missing, son. He's just way up there." He said, "Let me see if I can't help you get him down." He had a 12 gauge, and he'd shoot up there with that 12 gauge. And, and even him sometimes, he he'd cripple them up. They'd have to they'd fall down through the tree and give me a chance to shoot them when they was a little bit lower. But you know, the simple things in life like that just don't happen anymore. Things have really changed. Things have changed a lot. And that's what I always tell her. I, I, I tell people around me now, let, dare to be different. I drive through town and I look at the subdivisions. Because I, I was in a construction business. That's what I did for a living. I built houses. And I look at these subdivisions, the houses are like 10 to 12 feet apart and they're like cookie cutters. I mean, it's like you took a stamp one this way and then you flip it over, stamp it, flip it over, stamp it, flip it over. The whole neighborhood thinks they're different because their house is flipped over to the other side. Their bathroom's on the other end of the house instead of on this end of the house. And the next one's bathroom's flipped over to this side. You know, they just keep flipping the houses all around through the neighborhood. They all gotta be the same color. They all got to have the same roof pitch on them. One of them I lived in, they all had to have the same kind of mailboxes. had to be made out of copper. All of them had to have a gas light over the front door. Um, all your yards had to be manicured the same way. You could only have a certain amount of trees. You could only have certain kinds of trees. Couldn't have any animals. Couldn't have no chickens or nothing like that. And we think we're different because our house is flipped from our, next, from our neighbors. Well, my house ain't like yours. It's, mine's flipped over. 
the same house, just turned over, just flipped over, you know. But yet, we think we're different. God forbid you go into a community and build something different. I remember when I first built my first house across the road over here. I bought this land. There was only two other people that lived on the road other than me, and they were both old men. And I come in here and started building a nice two-story house over there. It was a wood house with wood siding and all on it, but it was two-story. Nice home. Porch, veranda porch around it. And I had the second floor all framed up and I was up on top of it working and one of the old men pulled up in there and he got out of his truck. I didn't know who he was. He come over and introduced himself. Said, I'm your neighbor. living in the second house down the road down here. And I, we sit and chit-chatted for a minute. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to do something about this house. I told him, I said, what do you mean I'm going to do something about the house? He says, we can't have it out here. He said, we don't live in these kind of homes. He said, this big old fine home. He said, uh, we're going to have to burn you out, looks like, if you build it. And me just buying the property, it was freaking me out a little bit. I was like, come on, man. I said, look, this is my property. I can build what I want. You know, he goes, well, we we just simple folk out here, you know, we live in simple houses. We ain't build nothing fancy like this, no big old fine home. I told him, I said, this ain't no fine home. I said, just a two-story house with wood siding on it and all. He said, well, and big old, it just looks like a big old fine home to me. He said, we probably have to burn you out. And it had me all nervous and scared and everything. I was like, wow, what have I done got myself into? And then he was busted out laughing. He said, no, nah, son. He said, you just keep doing what you want to do. He said, I'm just joshing with you. He said, good to see a neighbor come in. He said, the kind of house you're building there lets me know you're one of us. He said, you're not putting up some big old fine brick home out here with all this fancy stuff on it. He said, you just built a nice wood frame house, good wood side. It looks like it looks like it belongs in the country. Got the porch around it and everything. He said, I think we're going to be good neighbors, son. And I thanked him, and he got in his truck and drove off. And technically, that was the only time he ever come to visit me. But things is different now. It's just different. And that's the whole thing, guys. Just remember, the new agenda that's going to be forced upon us in the next coming years is for everybody to be the same. It's called Agenda 2030. And I'm begging you, Dare to be different. Do not fall prey to this system. Follow the word in the scriptures where it said, Come out from among them and be different or be separate. Don't get caught up in this system. Try to do it right. Don't go against the rules of your land like the scripture says, but try to be different. Guys, let's make a difference. Let's be the people that makes a difference. Thank you guys from Deep South Homestead.